Victoria Mukherjee. I'm a physician. I'm an associate professor at Harvard Medical School in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, and I'm the director of the master's program in global health delivery, um, of which we had our first Ghanaian graduate a couple years ago. Uh, I'm also the chief medical officer of the organization Partners in Health, which has projects in 10 different countries all over the world to deliver health care to poor people. You know, I work in many countries because I'm the chief medical officer of Partners in Health, and Partners in Health started working in Haiti 30 years ago, and I've been at Partners in Health for 18 years. Um, we started working in Rwanda in 2005, Malawi, Lesotho, and then recently Liberia and Sierra Leone. So I spent a lot of time in Africa. I also lived in Uganda for a couple of years in the 90s. So I've always been very interested in Pan-Africanism. I also work in the Caribbean. Um, I was a long, uh, interested fan of uh, Nkrumah and Kwame Nkrumah, and I think the idea of black liberation is a very fundamental tenant to having a more just world in my own country and around the world. What I think is important, and, and Partners in Health has six projects in Africa, in Rwanda, Lesotho, Malawi, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, and one very large project in Haiti. Um, and we have other projects in Latin America and the former Soviet Union, but as well as in uh, Navajo uh, in the US. But I think what we have found is that actually delivering medical care is something that had not been focused on academically for Africa and for poor communities. Poor communities were told prevention is all you can do. Prevention is better than cure. And yet we know the life expectancy throughout the continent in many places is 50 or less. And what people really need is medical care. And we have been very fortunate to provide medical care for people. In Haiti, we had been for a long time in Peru. And we became part of the international AIDS movement for treatment access. And that was the first movement that allowed people from poor countries to get access to medical treatment. And that changed everything from the public health perspective. Because once you say you can treat HIV, then you can treat lots of other things. You have drugs, you have labs, you need doctors and nurses. And so it allowed us collectively to reimagine health delivery, not just prevention, but the delivery of care. And so in the last 15 to 20 years, many countries have leveraged that funding, billions of dollars of new money, to support AIDS care, but to do more than that and really rebuild the health system that African people need and have a right to. And here in Ghana, the health system is much better than some of the neighboring countries, like Sierra Leone and Liberia, where I work, um, and Partners in Health Works, where Ebola struck through the, the heart of those countries because the health systems were so weak. And so we know that, one, people deserve health as a human right, but two, it will protect all of us from epidemic diseases, um, and from an increase uh, in, in transmission across the continent and even outside the continent um, that you know, really raise the standard of medical care for everybody as a basic right. So that's the kind of work I do. And we believe at Partners in Health, which is different than most American NGOs, that the way to do that is to support strong government and to support national plans to deliver care and not have our own agenda, but really work closely with ministers of health, um, with uh, ministers of finance, and how do we really make the systems work for local people, build real long-term capacity you know, in doctors, nurses, not just one-off trainings, but side-by-side -side mentorship. Um, and so that's the kind of work we do throughout Africa. <clears throat> I think one of the things I am always telling my students at Harvard and people I work with all over the world who have taught me this is the public sector in most poor countries, impoverished, I call, I call poor countries impoverished because the wealth has been robbed from Africa. It's not that Africa is poor, it's a very wealthy continent, but people don't own their own wealth, it's owned on the outside. And so um, after the period of independence, 
Um, the, the main way that governments put capital into their budgets, into their public budgets, was through loans from the World Bank and the IMF. Those loans came with conditions that the public sector had to be very, very tiny. And that was called the period of structural adjustment. And many African colleagues that I've had who are my age in their 50s uh, lived through the, these programs in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And on that sort of model of structural adjustment, of narrowing of the public sector, most African governments had less than $5 per capita to spend on health. So what does $5 buy you? It buys you a few vaccines. It buys you some salts that you give to children mixed in water if they have diarrhea, and maybe some bed nets and some family planning. It doesn't pay for salaries. It doesn't pay for infrastructure. It doesn't pay for the supply chain of drugs you need to treat illness. And so when you walk into many rural health centers throughout the continent, there's nobody there in the middle of the day. The light, there's no lights. There's no running water. There's nothing in the cupboard. And that then becomes a very underutilized service because the services are very poor. And so this is decades of underinvestment, decades of underinvestment and often a shrinking public budget. And so that's what a weak health system looks, looks like. And some governments have been progressive and tried to put money into the health sector, but many countries, the GDP is just too small to even if they make a larger commitment, it doesn't do much for the health sector. So with the AIDS money, some countries were very smart and they used that money that came from this global struggle against HIV to fund their health system and to leverage what we call vertical money to build a platform. And the country that's most famous for this, the two countries that are most famous for this are Rwanda and Ethiopia, both coming back from years of conflict, both very impoverished countries. But they said, let's use this money and, and build a basic platform for healthcare. And what we've seen in both countries, and I know Rwanda better, it's a place I've worked for 12 years, is that that strong governance on health and having a strong national plan and forcing each and every helper, donor, partner, NGO to, to take part in the national plan, not to develop a parallel system, not to fund sort of one-off trainings, but really contribute to the national plan. They've seen some of the steepest declines in mortality in human history. And so that the weak health system is underfunded, understaffed, under-resourced for supplies, and how do we build better? And how do we, instead of saying we're starting with $5 per capita, saying what is it that countries need to have a healthy population? Because we know development is profoundly impacted by health. So how do we get the money we need, $80 to $100, $120 per capita? And through international financing, through donors, but really align it all across a very strategic national plan to build a sector. Because what we've seen is once you do a good job, people will come forward. Unfortunately, there's this kind of history of I consider victim blaming and saying, oh, we need to create demand. We need to tell this lady to come forward. It's not that they don't want to come forward. It's that the health care provided is so poor that no one uses it because why would they waste a day of farming when they're gonna come, the medicines are stocked out, there's no one to see them, the lights aren't on. So if we build the supply, if we deliver care properly, then people will come. And what happened with Ebola is in those countries that had already many decades of impoverishment of the health system and then civil war, you know, and, and many years of war, there was very little health system at all. So as soon as an unusual event happens, a, a case of Ebola, which is a very obviously different thing. Ebola is a profoundly um, serious and rapid, rapidly fatal disease, but there's no system to say, oh, something is happening over here. You know, most people don't have minutes on their phone to even report it. Most of of the health centers don't have gloves, they don't have full-time staff. So that thing spread like wildfire. So we see it as a kind of a canary in the coal mine of these very weak health systems. We saw that Ebola, when it got to Nigeria, was stopped. Nigeria has a stronger system. We saw that when it got to Senegal, Senegal, it was stopped quickly. Um, even when one case was uh, suspected in Rwanda, they were immediately able to quarantine. So we got to build systems to give people health as a human right, but also to protect the, the, the population against disease. 
personally, what I see is a, you know, a failure of, and I'm seeing this in my own country, the United States, a failure of social protection, a failure of decent paying jobs, of health insurance, of fair education. And when you have that failure, you create a system that is ripe for radicalism. And we've seen that in the United States with the election of Donald Trump. And so what I would love to see and what I see in Rwanda and I see in other places, even a very poor country like Malawi, school is free, healthcare is there for people. It's not, it's not great, they'd like to do more, but they're able to do that. So I think strong governance and a commitment to some general public safety net um, is to me would be a very different model of development for Africa than we've allowed in the past. And I say we've allowed because the World Bank didn't allow it. You know, donors don't allow it. They, they're afraid, you know, in the Cold War, afraid of socialism, didn't want to put too much money in governance. But if we have strong governments that can adequately pay their staff, teachers, doctors, policemen, things we talked about in this conference, then there's less corruption. Then people are gonna get better public services and they'll be more effective as entrepreneurs. They'll be more effective, but right now the institutions of democracy are so weak. And that's a historical reality. That's not African, it's not, in my view, it's not corruption. Corruption is secondary to the impoverishment of the public sector. So I'd like to see a model much more like a European model than an American model where social protection is fundamental um, the right to health care, you know, a roof over your head, a decent paying job, that those protections are there. And then the, the other wonderful things that can happen through entrepreneurship can happen in a much sort of safer and better and more stable environment. I reimagine Africa to be a continent that has entrepreneurship and success but has it in a way that, that does not breed profound inequity and actually develops a social safety net where people have a right to health, education, jobs, and really more like Europe, but even in, in a better way, so that we see equity as part of the proposition for development and not just the kind of trickle-down model that's been imposed for many years. As an educator, I am continuing to educate Africans uh, to really have the credentials and the discernment to take on the established model for development and health and really reimagine it to empower governments to provide health care. And so I, I am working currently with three Liberian nationals, um, uh, a national from Swaziland, uh, one of our Ghanaian graduates, um, people from all over, uh, Rwanda, Malawi, to, to say that let's, let's have the public provision of health care as a basic human right. And what health? I think you know Harvard is an expensive institution, and we do try to raise money to support uh, African scholars and scholars from impoverished countries. But you know, if there are people who are interested in this model, I think scholarships for Africans to study at Harvard is a really important thing that we need.